why my, the question, the loaded, very loaded question is uh, in a fee only or a, a fee based asset management scenario where you're getting a percentage, like I said, the advisor is charging a percentage of the assets they're managing. Mm -hmm. It is often asked to me, why should I as a customer pay the advisor if the account is going down, mm. right? I understand that the account makes money, we both profit because, you know, hey, I made money, so you should make money too. But if I'm losing money, a lot of people say, then shouldn't you be losing money? Right. And and what I would suggest is the advisor is being paid less. So they feel the impact. The business is very aware of this impact. But what could potentially go wrong if you only paid your advisor when you made profits? Well, I'll ask this question. Wouldn't the advisor just want to take on more and more risk? Because if you're not getting paid when you're losing, wouldn't you just want to ratchet up the risk and try and get, you know, super high returns? And I don't know, like want or not, but wouldn't that be the incentive, right? Yeah. Because you're like, well, look, if I guess wrong and you don't make money, okay, I don't make money anyway. But if I guess right and you make some money, I get paid. Right. So you kind of disincentivize risk management. It's like telling a baseball player in the major leagues, you know, basically you're only going to get paid if you hit home runs. Well, he's going to swing like crazy every time he steps up to the plate yes. and he's going to only, he's going to swing at almost everything. Yeah. If it could be a home run ball, may as well. You yeah. Know, because if there's no penalty, it's like, look, it'd be different if you're you said swing at every you're going to get paid for home runs. Yep. But you're not, you know, and you'll get paid for base hits too, right? Like, yeah, it, it's kind of one of those you things. you lose your say, entire paycheck if it's a walk. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean? sort of say like, you don't get paid if you strike out. That would be the better one, right? A walk actually still gets you on base. That's, that's, a, that's playing it smart, right? Mm -hmm. But if you, it, what's the difference? You only get paid to make home runs or you don't get paid if you strike out. There's a difference. One of them is going to be more defensive in nature. They're going to go for high percentage shots. And th that's the thing about investing is like a lot of folks, you know, there's different philosophies. It's like, well, look, I'm going to take 20 bets and one of them is going to be a home run and it's going to make up for the 19 losers. We don't prescribe to that theory, just so you guys are aware. Yeah. Right. It is about um, long term diversification value. And there's a lot of risk management strategies associated. And you know why? Easy answer. Like, why should you manage risk? Because sometimes clients need to take money out and you don't want your account to be way down when you need to access that the money. That is so true. Yeah. Right. That's a, sometimes that's... you need the money. And so if you are. Yeah. Risk... Wouldn't you rather take yeah, money it... out when the markets are up? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure. You definitely don't want to wait until like how. Uh, the most recent example, like 2019 going into 2020, March of 2020, markets fall like 30 something percent in weeks, mm -hmm. right? Two, three weeks, everything just collapses. What if you had to move and you had to take a big withdrawal from your investment accounts once th you're getting 30 percent less purchasing power at that right. moment? Yeah. Okay? Well, and I think I'm glad you brought this up because I actually hear this question all the time. People are like, is it a good time for me to take some money? And I do often say, hey, let's take a look at, you know, where is the account? And oh my goodness, you're up $50,000 this year. Go ahead and take $20,000 yeah, out. Unless you like have 500 million and be like, well, you're barely making anything, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So remember, numbers should always have context. That's another one that I would That's tell you true. for any financial advisors out there. It's like, make sure the numbers have context because mm -hmm. there's three kinds of lies in the world, right? There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. I, and I've seen that, you know, where someone's like, hey, you know, I'm down $100,000. And it's like, you have a $3 million account. Like, that's a normal... Yeah, um, yeah we call that months. Tuesday, yeah. right? It's just, it's it's a... Percentage wise, it's not significant to the total volume of the account. Exactly. Uh, it's like, you know, if the diving board is six inches long, it, it, you know, it doesn't move much. But when it's 60 feet long, a one degree move translates mm -hmm. to a, a big fluctuation on the end of that board. Right. right. And that's yeah. what big accounts look like is they just it's bigger moves. Mm -hmm. And then it's always funny, too. And that person's like, well, you know, my account's up 12 percent, but the S&P is up 13. And it's like, <laughs> Yeah, it's a 1% difference, but 
Well, it, it, it does add up over time. Um, but this, again, is one of those, the idea that... Well, it's when people aren't measuring the same way each time. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm looking at this loss. Well, that's half a percent. And then they go and then they change it. And then they start looking at percentages when it's time to evaluate performance yeah. instead of dollar amounts. You're up $1 million this year. Well, I really wanted to be up 1.1. 1. 1. And it's like, I, it's the I tyranny it, of absolute versus relative yeah. return, right? Like yeah. on an absolute basis, here's the dollars that I gained or lost right. on a, on a percentage basis or relative basis. I'm up this much or I'm yeah. this percentage or that percentage or down that percentage. Well, it right. all is based on when you're measuring it too. I was looking at some performance numbers today mm -hmm. and it, it absolutely blew me away. I changed the calendar dates by like 20 something days. Mm -hmm. And the percent return on this one thing I was looking at went from like seven to 10. And right. I'm like, so if you had measured, you know, 20 days into the cycle past when it started, your numbers wouldn't look that great. But yeah. you add the last couple weeks of that in there and it's like now it looks awesome so yeah. you can really manipulate the numbers by changing the dates and that's the thing it's it's hard to do also like i don't see performance reporting done this way um, i've worked in some softwares that does this a little bit but it's interesting if you were to take a rolling average return in an account okay we do this a lot in the advisory landscape when you're doing investment research you might say well i want to see a 200 day moving average of the price of a stock and what you're doing is just saying well here's the average price for the last 200 days and tomorrow i'm going to take the oldest day off and i'm add the new day in and i'm going to take a new average and I'm going to plot that over time, and it sort of smooths out the ups and the downs. Mm -hmm. And so a 200-day price average, you can see, well, here's the current price compared to the last 200 days. We call that a 200-day moving average, or maybe a 50-day moving average, or a 10-day moving average. But it's, it's a way to get a sense of how is the stock moving, not moment to moment, but over a period of time. But you don't see people measure their performance that way very often. They typically look at a calendar year and say, well, show me January 1 to December 31 and show me that snapshot. And that's how I decide if it's working or not. Mm -hmm. That's largely what the mutual industry, mutual fund industry does. And it's where a term called window dressing comes from. Tell right? me about window dressing. Window dressing is essentially trying to set the system up so that the numbers look good for a calendar basis. And so you see shuffling things around late late November, early December, to try to position so that uh, a, a mutual fund number looks good on at the end. So, it's, so it's, you're saying like, as an example, maybe a mutual fund manager is in November and they're way above the target where they wanted to hit for the year. They're or, like, or to get a bonus, perhaps. Maybe they are, they're bonused against how they perform against a benchmark. Right. And so if they're crushing the benchmark, they could, in theory... Basically, you know, if the agreements of the mutual fund allow for it, they could reposition assets around to lower their risk exposure and try and lock in that gain. They could the potentially. Or here's another one. Let's suppose that they're not going to hit their bonuses. They take on more risk? Well, they don't necessarily, but they can do things like they can distribute a bunch of their adverse capital gains just to get it out of the way. Right? Because mm. there's an interesting thing about the way mutual funds operate where they can choose when they declare their capital gains or losses, right? So they don't declare a loss. They're never going to make a loss. Oh, so effort. you're saying if they're going to end but up missing they'll just missing say, it. I'm going to just, yeah, I'm going to miss anyway. Then let's get this toxic stuff off the books to set up a better next year. Oh, so they might liquidate. It's possible. Yeah. It's possible that yeah. something like that could happen. You'd have to look at the prospectus. and uh, But but if you've got a whole bunch of embedded capital gains and you're not going to hit stuff anyway, you, then, you, you, know, you just rip the Band-Aid off and, and you know set yourself up so that the next year can look better. Hmm. It's it's potential out there. And then there. maybe even rebuy it if it's a position that they still like. Sure. Yeah. They, they could potentially change their, their basis and do tax management within the the fund. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't happen often. I, like, I don't think this is a, an abused scenario, but it's not impossible. Right. Right. And so those are just elements that happen when you're in a, in a managed product like that. Right. right. I said a, a, gain, a capital gain distribution could occur and it's outside of your ability to control the And that's make. not to say that all managed products are bad, right? No, no, because, we're not. It's just a feature yeah. of managed. But there's other features of managed product that are kind of handy. Like you right. could, 
you know, you have your own capital gain of when you buy or sell it, but they may never distribute a gain to you. So you could have some tax efficiency because they're taking in new cash. And mm. so they're rebalancing their portfolio with the new cash from new investors, which means that you may actually experience increased tax efficiency in some Ooh, scenarios. double-edged sword. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it can work out nicely uh, in that respect. But um, all of this to get back to the idea that... Um, when you're, well, I, I think I kind of even lost some of the original idea. We just started going down the mutual fund path so much. Um, oh, the moving average. That's yeah. really what it came down to. It's like, well, if you're looking at how well your returns are, uh, I think you're better off saying, well, here was my January to January, February to February, March to March, April to April, and then take, take a look at how that evolves over time. That gives you a sense of how stable your portfolio is and what your actual rolling return looks like. Okay. Yeah. And again, not common to do. Most people just take a 12-month snapshot of what they were doing previously and maybe a three-year snapshot and kind of go, well, here's the trend and here's how, how we're looking.